Hi and welcome to this tutorial on the Substance Baker Bridge for Mari. The bridge was first introduced as part of the Mari Extension Pack 5R6 release and has been updated in 5R6 v2. It allows you to utilize the powerful and extremely fast Substance Bakers directly from within Mari using the Substance Automation Toolkit as a connection. The Baker Bridge acts very similar to the Mesh Baker interface in Substance Designer, so if you are familiar already with Designer's Baking, you will feel pretty much right at home. There are, however, some differences that are worth understanding, but if you are overall already comfortable with designer's baking, you can skip ahead to the chapter Configuring Ignore Backfacing, and you can find the link for that in the video description. In addition, the Bridge UI heavily uses tooltips, so if something is unclear, you might want to see if there's a tooltip description. And of course, all the information from this video is also available in detail in the online help in the Baker section. First, let's quickly talk about what you need on the Substance side to utilize the bridge, which is the Substance Automation Toolkit. The Automation Toolkit is a set of libraries that can be downloaded and installed if you have access to a Substance subscription. In that case, you can find the Automation Toolkit download directly in your licenses. You can install it locally or, if you are for example in a studio, copy it to a network location, in which case you can set the environment variable shown here to declare the location of the installation for your system. Inside of Maori, you can find the Baker Bridge in the upper left corner of the UI here. If you have installed the toolkit in one of the standard locations, where I have the previously mentioned environment variable declared, the bridge will start up ready to use. If not, this dialog will pop up, asking you to specify the install location of the Substance Automation Toolkit first, before you can use the bridge. Let's talk a little about the UI of the bridge, with the Maori object you want to back maps for being selectable here in the upper left corner. The currently selected Mari object in your project will be pre-selected as the active object when you start the bridge. Next we have the high definition mesh list, where you can choose a Mari object from your project or an external file to bake high-res details onto a Mari object. The high-res meshes can for example be used to bake displacements from a sculpt onto a lower mesh, so a mesh that is inside your Mari project. So in this case you don't even need to load the high-res mesh into Mari, but you can just directly specify an external file for it. And as long as the high-res and low-res mesh occupy the same space, the details will be correctly transferred. High-res meshes are also needed for any baker that ends with from mesh in its name. You can see here the list of available bakers, and we have for example a curvature baker and a curvature for mesh one. The curvature for mesh one will rely on the high-res object to calculate its curvature and then transfer the result of that bake onto the low-res mesh. So again, the lowest mesh in this case refers to the mesh in Mari you're baking to. Oftentimes, however, you don't have a high-res mesh at all, and you just want to use the original render mesh or Mari mesh to generate the curvature, which is where the use low as high definition checkbox here comes in. If that is on and you're using a from mesh baker, the bridge will automatically link the original Mari mesh from the section up here into your bakes as a high-res mesh. High-res meshes are also needed if you want to have multiple objects in your Mari scene influence each other. By default, each object you want to bake maps for is unaware of other objects next to it. So for example, if you have a floor object and you want to bake the occlusion cast by a couch object onto it, you need to specify both the couch and floor as a high-res object so they are calculated together. There are some additional cool features available for the high-res meshes, such as the ability to create bake sets, which we will cover at the end of this tutorial. The Baker Default Settings section defines the default settings any newly created baker should be set at. Here we can for example specify the resolution, anti-aliasing, if the bake should be imported as a normal Mari channel or as a geo channel, and of course the number of UDIMs you want to bake. For the UDIM range you can use the star to specify all UDIMs, or use common sequence operators such as comma and dash to specify different ranges. Additionally, you can also auto-set the range based on your current project selection or a selection group you have in your Mari project, as seen here. When adding a new baker, the baker will have these defaults set. However, each setting can be overwritten by double-clicking on it and setting a custom one like here, where I'm changing the channel name that the resulting bake should be imported into in Mari. Just a quick note on the anti-aliasing. In general, it's actually faster to bake a higher resolution map than applying anti-aliasing to a lower resolution one. So it's just a small tip to remember. Above the baker render list, we have some basic options to duplicate bakers, remove bakers, or reorder the list of bakers, which will influence in what order the bakes are executed and imported to Mari. 
The apply new defaults button on the far right here will update all bakers in your list with these settings in the default baker settings section. So if I have multiple bakers in my list, such as here, and I want to batch change the UDIM range for all of them, I can change the UDIM range up here in the default settings section, and then push the updates onto all existing bakers. Next, we have the general settings UI section, which globally sets the array distance the bakers should evaluate via the frontal and rear value. The array distance is the calculation cutoff point based on the normal orientation. Here we have an example of two faces at an angle. If your frontal distance would be set to 0.1 and you would bake for example in occlusion, darkening would only happen in areas where the two faces have a distance of 0 to 0.1, but not where it is over 0.1. Increasing the frontal value will then darken the area more and more going away from the sharp corner. The same is true with the rear value. If you have another face on the back side within the rear value range, occlusion would bleed onto the front face as well. The relative to bounding box checkbox then determines if these values entered here will be treated as a percentage of the overall object size or a fixed absolute unit distance, like centimeters for example. Only having the front and rear value as a constant value across the mesh might not always produce the cleanest results, especially in more difficult corners. This is why you can also set the distance using another mesh, a so-called cage. Cage meshes can be set to have custom distances at each point of your mesh. In this example here, you could for example create a second mesh variant as a cage that looks like this to deal with the sharp corner while having a different distance in other parts of the mesh. I will skip over the matching dropdown since it is related to the creation of bake sets which I will cover at the end of the tutorial. So we are only left with the dilation and diffusion options. The dilation will basically expand your baked values beyond the v-shells by the percentage specified here. This is to avoid seams introduced by mip mapping in your render when you are further away from your object. The diffusion then will fill the remaining empty space in your maps with a soft gradient of very similar colors. The dilation and diffusion are actually quite heavy operations that sometimes take longer than the bake itself. So for quick previews it can be quite good to set the dilation to zero, but just don't forget to turn it back on for the final bake. Below the general settings you will find the tool configuration settings, which are bridge specific settings, so they are not really related to the substance baking itself. First up we have the path to the substance automation toolkit install folder, which you can change here or reset to the default setting, which either is a standard install directory or the install directory specified by the sat install path environment variable. When clicking on the little cog icon, you can access some settings for the substance automation toolkit. The most important one is obviously the GPU ray tracing, which will greatly speed up your bake times. The force DXR or optics ray tracing, you can usually leave off since the tool will try to automatically use the best available option based on the graphics card you have. The verbose baking log, on the other hand, you might want to turn on in certain situations, where you need to debug a bake process. By default, the render log shown here will give you quite well formatted, easily readable messages that are purely generated by the bridge. If the verbose baking log is on, however, in addition to the bridge messages, you will also get the raw output from substance printed into the log. Here it is visible as purple messages. But usually it is okay to leave that off and only turn it on when for example something is behaving weirdly in your bake and you want to see more information about it. Also in the tool config section is the location of the temp data. The bridge stores a bunch of temporary files for a bake, such as mesh data and of course bake textures that are then imported into Mari and here you can set where to store those. By default they will be in a subfolder called bakes in your current Mari project directory which is indicated by the $project dollar variable, but of course you can change that and place the files wherever you want. You can also open the currently set location via the location button here or revert back to the default location which again is in your project directory. Now the next setting is quite an important one, the way the bridge should clean up data. You can see here by default the delete after bake section is set to delete all temporary meshes and the bake maps after a bake is completed and imported into Mari. You can switch that around to your liking, however there is one big caveat. When you are baking a preview by the bake preview button, the temporary mesh will never be deleted after, no matter what setting is chosen in this dropdown. Why is that? Well, simply put, exporting mesh data can be a very long process. Imagine you have a 1 gig mesh that needs to be exported each time you hit bake. You're going to wait quite a while for that to export, potentially much longer than the bake itself. So in order to have really quick preview turnovers, the meshes are kept. 
So what are the potential dangers of this? Well, let's imagine an example. Let's say you are baking an occlusion with the bake preview to tweak some settings. Then you close the baker bridge without doing a final bake and import a new object version into Mari and you open the baker bridge again. If you now hit either bake preview or even a full bake, the bridge will see that there's already a mesh export and use that one. Which in that case, since you changed the object version since then, is the old version of the mesh. You will see in the render log here a lot of messages telling you and warning you that an existing version is being used. So if something doesn't feel right, it might be worth checking that. You can always manually delete the bake data, even for previews, by clicking on that little sparkle icon next to the dropdown. So this is really the most important thing I want you to remember from this tutorial. Preview bakes do not delete their data on disk after the preview is done. Only full bakes do, and only if the dropdown is set to delete it. Last but not least, we have the preview resolution. It's pretty self-explanatory, I think. It is the percentage of the bake resolution to render if hitting the bake preview button. So if your baker is set to render 1K and you have the preview res at 50%, baking a preview gives you a preview in 512 times 512 resolution. All of these settings, as well as your bakers, can be of course saved as presets in the section down here. The bridge also maintains two automatic presets for you, a project-specific last bake and a non-project-specific last bake. What that means is that the project-specific one also saves things such as your mesh and object selection, while the non-project-specific ones only save settings and baker setups, but not which objects to bake. Last note on the presets, you can back up those by going to their safe location with this button, and you can also use the environment variable shown here to populate presets, for example to have a studio or show specific presets for the entire team. Before we end this UI overview, let's take a look on the right side of the dialog. The preview section will show you your bakes as they're finishing up. You can switch between objects and bakes as well up here. And you can also pause the showing of the previews by clicking on the pause button. This can be a good thing if you're baking massive assets with hundreds or even thousands of UDIMs to spare your RAM the hit of loading all these images into the preview window. Finally, at the bottom here, we have the render log, which we have touched on a little before. You will get different color codings for different message types, and the messages are hopefully quite clear and easy to understand. And remember, you can always turn on the full debug mode via the automation toolkit settings here and ticking on the verbose log. That ends this UI tour. We will be taking a look at some special bake behaviors and how we can create, for example, bake sets and stuff like that next. So for some bakes, you might want to ignore back faces in order to improve the results. If we look at the Mari default head here without back faces ignored, you can see how the inner mouth area turns quite dark when we bake an occlusion. If we ignore back faces on the other hand, the mouth doesn't get so dark. So how do we turn this on? Well, let's take a look at the ambient occlusion for mesh baker. Under its baker parameters, we have a setting for ignore back faces. We have three options, always, which will basically turn on ignore back faces on globally for this baker, never, which will turn it off globally, and by high dev mesh setting. If we choose that last one, we can individually configure different mesh parts via the high res mesh list. But first, of course, we need a mesh here. And in this case, I can only really add one, which is the same head, which I also have as a target up here. So let me add that into the high res mesh list and you can see the ignore back faces checkbox that I can tick on. So how is that different to turning on always in the baker settings? Well, here in this case now, I have not only a head, but also the body in my project. So now I can tick on ignore back faces for the head, but leave it off for the body. In this way, I can isolate this behavior to only occur where I want it, while still baking everything with the same baker. So I have the gramophone object here that is part of the extension pack default objects and I want to bake some occlusion for this. So let's open the bridge and just add an ambient occlusion for mesh baker and just for speed I will reduce the bake size to 1k and let's just hit bake and see what we get. And here we are but I'm not really happy with this occlusion. First of all I think there's too much overall occlusion, so the width of the occlusion is way too wide. But what's really bothering me is how dark the disk gets, because it gets heavy downward occlusion from the funnel, but also some from the funnel holder here. 
So first let's just try and reduce the occlusion distance and see what that does. So I'm just going to set the max occluder distance to half what it was before and rebake. Now you might be noticing this field here turning orange. This is a warning that a channel called ambient occlusion already exists in your project. And if we hover our cursor above the field, we will get more information. Now this isn't blocking me from baking, as the bridge will just add another layer to the existing channel. So let's just bake this and see how it looks. It's better on the body, but the disk is still getting heavily drowned in occlusion. So we need to do something different here. Let's scroll down in the occlusion settings bit and we will find a dropdown called self-occlusion that is set to always by default. When it is on always, the object you're baking onto up here in the list of Mari objects will always cast occlusion onto itself fully and completely. The other option available here is by high def matching. If we set it to that and just bake a preview, you will see nothing seems to change. The reason for that is that we don't have any high-res object and only have the checkbox use low as high definition turned on. So let's go ahead and rectify this. I'm going to add the pieces of the gramophone as separate pieces to my high definition mesh list. You will see in a second why I have it as separate pieces. So let's go here and just load in all the mesh parts and let's just bake another preview. Very different, that's for sure, but still not what we want. I mean, I want the occlusion on the body to be the way I had it before and just fine tune some of it, right? Now the dropdown option is called by high def matching. And if you have been studying the interface a little, you might have noticed another match option right up here in the general settings. If we change this from always to by high def matching as well, you will suddenly see some buttons labeled match appearing next to your high res objects. If we click on this, a dialog will open where you can link each high res object to a target object to bake. So let's go ahead and link each of these high def objects to the gramophone. And just as a little trick, you can right mouse click on the match button and just copy these settings across to the others. Since I have the funnel as a separate object, I'm going to untick this and exclude it from the calculation. And let's just bake a preview. Two things you will notice now. The middle UDIM range here that was holding the UVs for the funnel went all gray because we no longer were baking the funnel. And the disk suddenly got a lot brighter and less occluded, which is what we are after. We still have some occlusion though on the disk from the funnel holder. So let's rectify this. I'm overall happy with this baker, so I'm not going to change that one, but duplicate it. Since I only want to tweak the disk a little, I'm going to limit it to UDIM 1006 and just reduce the occlusion distance further for this one. And let's bake a new preview. And since at the moment I'm only interested in the top baker, I can deactivate the second one for the preview. Good, perfect. So we now have what we want for the body of the gramophone, but we obviously still need to bring back the funnel. So let's duplicate the baker again and move it to the top. I want to have the thicker occlusion on that one, so I'm going to increase the max occluder distance again. I also want to limit this to the UDIM range of the funnel. So I can either enter the UDIM range manually, or since I have a selection set, I can use that one in my Mari project and get the range straight from there. For that baker, I'm going to set the self occlusion back to always, since we have previously unticked the funnel in the high def mesh list for the other bakers. And then we will bake. Great. That looks a lot better. So the bridge now executed the bakes in order bottom to top. So we have nice layering as we can see. There's more we could tweak to make this a better occlusion bake, but I think you get the general idea what sort of options are available to selectively tweak the self occlusion on an object. So let's move on to the last short topic, general object matching. I have a simple hypothetical scene here with a couch, a floor and a wall. I want the wall to affect the floor and vice versa to get occlusion in the corner where the two meet. And I want the couch to cast occlusion onto the floor in order to use that for a dirt effect. What I don't want is this ugly occlusion the couch is casting onto the wall. So let's just quickly open the bridge again and take a look how to achieve this. I have my three objects in the list of objects to bake, although I could untick the couch since I'm not really interested in baking a map for it. But let's just leave it on since it doesn't hurt either. First, let's add an ambient occlusion for mesh bake. 
And again, the channel name goes orange because the channel already exists in my project, but that's okay. Next, let's add the three objects to my high dev objects. And this time around, I have them all in Mari, so I can just add them from my Mari objects. Like in the previous topic of self occlusion, I'm going to set the match in the general settings to buy high dev matching and then edit the individual matching. For the floor object, I want it to affect everything, so itself, the walls, and the couch. Same for the wall itself, it can cast occlusion onto the floor itself and the couch. For the couch, however, I only want it to be calculated for itself and the floor, but not when baking the walls, so we leave the walls unticked. And let's bake a preview and see what we get. If I switch through the objects here, I can see the floor has a thick couch occlusion, but the wall doesn't, so that's perfect and what we want. Now before I do a final bake for this, I want to use this example of showing a thing that might trip you up. As I mentioned before, baking a preview will not delete any temporary mesh data from disk, meaning the next bake or preview bake will reuse the old mesh data already on disk. The matching I made here is actually written into the temporary mesh data, so it's a setting that is now living inside the files. So if I wanted to suddenly have my couch occlusion back onto the wall, it would look the same now as before when baking because it would use the old files. So in this case, I will have to clean up the mesh data myself by clicking on that little sparkle icon to manually delete mesh data on disk. It shouldn't happen often, but this is just one of those peculiar things where I had to find a solution for fringe cases, and I favored the speed of having the data on disk and not having to export it over and over for each preview. Anyway, let's do our bake and see how this looks. And we have exactly what we want the couch not casting occlusion onto the walls, while everything else still affects each other. So this wraps up this lengthy tutorial. I hope you learned a thing or two. Happy baking and see you next time.